Okay. Hello and welcome everybody to Parsha Kitetze 5783, Parsha class. And uh, I want to dedicate uh, today's class in the memory of Helen Dover, of Leah Bat Miriam Vamosha, and the Shemba should have an Aliyah, and uh, the schut, the merit of our learning, should be uh, should be for her. All the great things she did to support the shul, to help the shul, should continue to be a uh, merit for her. Um, as uh, she gets higher and higher in the gates of Shemayim. Uh, the Parsha Kitetse is full of mitzvot, like just full, like, uh, like a pomegranate is full of seeds. This Parsha has so many mitzvot. They say uh, the 74 mitzvot in this Parsha alone. And that's quite a bit, right? Considering that there's only 110 psukim, almost every verse, you can see that it's, uh, seven out of 10 verses has a, is, is a separate mitzvah. So there's a, there's a lot, many, many mitzvot, um, 27 positive, 47 negative, and uh, includes the, I mean, just the whole gamut of the Talmud can be found in, in the, this parsha. There, there's not, there's probably not a page of the Talmud that can be learned that doesn't quote something from this parsha. So, uh, take for example, uh, we have the the mitzvah of of uh, that uh, a father is obligated to give a double share to his firstborn under normal circumstances. Uh, that there's a son to call the Ben Sor or Omore. We spoke about that in previous years. This rebellious child who's punished before he even gets the chance to grow up. And a very unusual mitzvah. And we've spoken about that, as I said, in previous years. Uh, the mitzvah of burial, the mitzvah of tzitzit, of shatnas. We'll, we'll speak about some of that today, God willing. The uh, keeping the 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 Machana Yehuda, the the keeping the the, the Jewish camp clean uh, of, of, of waste and of immorality, even in times of war, says Rav Hirsch. Even especially, you know, in normal times of war, people sort of lessen their holiness and become more animalistic. Even that, the Torah is warning us against. A returning a slave who ran away or not returning the slave under certain circumstances, kidnap, uh, protecting widows, orphans, the, uh, the punishment for embarrassing somebody. And, uh, and last but not least, uh, very famously, as we read the Parsha before, uh, uh, before Purim, we read the Parsha of Zachor. That's in this week's Parsha as well. Remembering the mitzvah of Amalek and the, the need, the necessary step we have to take as a Jewish people to eradicate all kinds of Amalek from the world, whether it means this particular nation, which seems to have been gone, or if it's a particular Mida, a particular characteristic of this nation that still exists in the world, and it's our obligation uh, to the best of our ability to eradicate it uh, one, uh, one lesson at a time. Uh, with that said, let's go into a deep dive into the Pasha. We don't have a lot of psukim to talk about, but uh, what I'd like to do uh, today, if possible, if uh, if you allow it, is I would like to talk about the reasons for some of these mitzvot, maybe talk about the mitzvah itself as well, halacha, etc., but talk about the reason for the mitzvah as best we can, and uh, in some of these cases. And finally, I want to leave you with another proof that the Torah is much, much deeper than we might think. It's not just that there's 74 mitzvot in this parsha. The there's depth in the wording and in the everything else. And we're going to see uh, a very interesting, fascinating facet of that. I think uh, at the end of the class today, God willing. Let's uh, let's share the screen. This is the uh, the the source sheet that I shared with you by email yesterday. And uh, if you did not receive it, or if you would like to receive emails from me with the source sheet, etc., cetera, uh, by all means, let me know. Also, it is, if you're watching this on YouTube, this source sheet is linked in, uh, in the description of the video, as always. Okay, 
Baruch Hashem. We're uh, I'm going to start here uh, towards the beginning of the parsha, chapter twenty-two, verse one. Um, and of course, we've skipped a lot. We've spoken about the beginning of the parsha in previous classes, as I've said before. Uh, but um, there's a verse in chapter twenty-two, verse one. Chav bet pasuk aleph lo tire et shor achicha o et seo nedachim. You should not see your fellows. In other words, uh, another Jew's ox or sheep, um, just straying around. Right, hit alamta mehem hashev tishivim laachicha. Don't ignore it. Yeah, you know, make sure you bring it back to your friend, to your brother, to your peer. And uh, so it seems like the Torah has a deep desire to make sure we return other people's lost property. There is such a mitzvah, a Shavat Aveda, to return lost property, whether it's an animal, whether it's an item, you see your friend's um say car right you know it's your friend's car same license plate same color same model etc and you know that's your friend's car and you know your friend is missing the car and you're driving around and you see it you should find a way to return it obviously contact the authorities because you don't want to get yourself in any kind of harm nowadays but uh whatever means are necessary you don't just ignore it ah it's somebody else's problem it's my friend's problem he'll figure it out we don't, we don't do that. And uh, obviously, not, not just high value items like cars, even small things. You see, your friend uh, lost uh, or forgot, uh, I don't know, something uh, inexpensive, uh, a box of uh, a box of Tic Tacs, right? <laughs> so uh, you don't eat the Tic Tacs. You don't throw them away. What do you do? You, you know who's, if you know whose it is, you return it to them. You have a pretty good idea. You know, this person t- eats Tic Tacs. Uh, I don't know why I brought up that particular item. I'm not uh, advertising it or anything. Right? And uh, the person, and you find the Tic Tacs uh, next to the person's seat. So it's an easy, uh, it's an easy connection. Next morning uh, at davening, try to see if uh, if uh, if your friend lost uh, their uh, the candy. All right, whatever it is. Why is it that the Torah cares so much about this? Right. To, to, to mention so many psukim, there's so many verses about this mitzvah. So, don't uh, ignore uh, the uh, the lost object, as it says in our verse. Ta mitzvah zu. There's a reason for this mitzvah. If the Torah is obligating you to return the money of your friend, all the more so the person's soul. What does that mean? So we know that we ha- there's a special mitzvah, not explicitly in the Torah, but there's a mitzvah that the uh, the here the Shnei Luchot Abrit the Shla Hakadosh the Holy Shla is telling us that there Rabbi Yeshaya Halevi Horowitz that um, if we care about people's money how much more so should we care about their soul? In other words, it's our obligation Kiruv Rechokim becomes our obligation to bring souls back to return them to where they belong. You see somebody who's not following the proper path of Torah, and whether they know it or not, they are suffering. And I don't mean in the world to come where there's a punishment, etc. But in this world, they're not benefiting, as we've been saying in many of the classes that we've had, that the Torah considers it. And uh, I should say, I might add that uh, anecdotally, I've seen uh, that Life is better when you're following the Torah. It's a fair statement. And therefore, for their benefit, you want to help them 
come back to, to Judaism. That doesn't mean yell at them. That doesn't mean force them to do a mitzvah. What that means is you're kind to them and you invite them and you're open to them. You answer their questions and you maybe start learning with them. That is also Hashavat Aveda. In fact, what the Shalah here is saying is Hashavat Aveda, returning lost property, is just a stepping stone to teach you how important it is to return a more important thing, a holy thing, the soul. And you have the obligation, if you have the ability, you have to do whatever it takes to, you see a, you see a Jew in the supermarket, you invite them for Shabbat, you see what, what, people always have questions, comments, requests, dedications. If you have the ability to, uh, to, to influence them in a positive way towards Torah, that is what the Shalah says this Pasuk is really talking about. Okay. Uh, that said, so we see, I just want to, again, emphasize, in case, uh, in, in case it doesn't uh, come through. I want to emphasize that there's a lot of mitzvot in the Torah, and all of those mitzvot have a purpose. They have a lesson inside them. It's not, oh, I'm just returning lost things because I'm a humanitarian. I'm a kind person. Returning a lost thing is normal. Well, we know that there's, first of all, there are other faiths in the world where returning a lost thing is, is not considered normal, is in fact considered evil because it's uh, anti-karma or whatever, right? Obviously, the quote-unquote, the gods, the fates, whatever, cause this person to lose their box of candy. You're returning it to them? Well, well, what's wrong with you? Why are you trying to fight fate? You know, karma isn't very uh, nice, as a paraphrase of the statement. Right? Uh, we don't care about that. Hashem tells us to return things anyway. And the returning of things isn't just a lesson in uh, in economics, it isn't just a lesson in uh, in humanitarianism. It's also a lesson in spirituality. More important than returning a lost object, says the Shla, is the returning of a lost soul. All right. So with that, we start off, and we're gonna skip to chapter twenty-two, verse eleven, just a few verses down. And here is one of the possibly strangest chukim in the Torah. Strangest laws that require some explanation. It says, Lo tilbas shatnes tzemerufishtim yachta. You shall not wear clothing that has a combination of wool and linen. Mitzvah of shatnes. Famous mitzvah. A lot of people are very careful about this. They make sure even uh, really the only issue halachically is in things that have you would expect to have wool, a wool suit, if it's uh, made from a fancy um, company, upper class sort of uh, suit maker. They might in, they might also sew in some linen to harden the uh, the lapels or whatever else. I'm not really a, a big expert in this uh, particular field, but certainly uh, the the cheaper suits are not usually a problem. But nevertheless, people take even their cheaper suits to get checked for shotness. Some people take regular clothes made from cotton even to, to, to be checked for shotness. You don't really need to. It's really mostly suits, uh, uh, certain uh, fancier uh, women's wardrobe uh, pieces. The, uh, the, uh, the raincoats might have shotness. Anything that really is expected to have wool but uh, but it's also from the uh, from the fancier end that might have some linen sewed into it. So that needs to be checked. There's a lot of ways to do that, uh, and uh, and that's the halacha. So halacha today, you should not wear clothing without wool and linen. Now, there are reasons for this. Before you tell me, wait a minute, the Rambam says, and you quoted this in previous classes that the, the Torah says you don't need to have reasons for mitzvot. That's true. It's 100% true. The Gemara says the same thing. It's it, absolutely 100%. When it comes to reasons for mitzvot, there isn't any one reason. There are multiple reasons and multiple things that it's supposed to teach us. However, it helps us as human beings 
to have some rationale for why to do something. It could be, by the way, just uh, one of the rationales could be that for some spiritual thing that we are not connected to, that we just it's just too deep for us, for some reason, jumping uh, through hoops of some sort is the reason for this mitzvah. So jumping through some, we don't know the reason, but there is a reason, okay? You could do it for that. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that as long as you know you're doing the mitzvah and, and you're doing it because Hashem told you, by all means, nothing wrong with that. However, many of our commentaries, even after they say stuff like that, like they, they don't need to have a reason for a mitzvah, they still propose a possible reason for the mitzvah anyway. And what I'd like to share with you today is three, count them, three different possible reasons for this mitzvah of uh, shotness, this obligation of, for a Jew to not wear clothing with wool and linen. I remember I, I heard from Rabbi Foyer back in my yeshiva days, Rabbi Avram Chaim Foyer Shlita, uh, he said that uh, he had a student in yeshiva who was ex-military. He was he was on a, he was in the navy, and he uh, he landed. He, um, I don't know what the name of the position is. I apologize, but uh, he worked on an aircraft carrier, and he helped the 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 jets land onto the aircraft carrier. And they had to wear. Obviously, the jets are very very loud, and they wore. Uh, they wore headphones, uh, like uh, sound muffling uh, headphones that, uh, that that had to obviously fit on their heads, but at the same time be uh, be, be thin enough to be able to take off, etc. And they said that the entire thing was a thin layer of wool and linen. And he used this as a proof for something it says in Chazal. The rabbis tell us. That somebody who wears shotness, that person's prayers are not heard. So it's fascinating, says Rob Foyer, that the very, very fact that the rabbi said that prayers are not heard by, by Hashem because you're wearing shotness, it's fascinating that shotness is the thing that a thin layer of it is enough to muffle such loud noises, right? That it, it, it does indeed muffle noise, shotness. And that's perhaps. Another reason for for this mitzvah that's not one of the ones that I'm going to bring to you now from the classics. What I'd like to share with you first is the Midrash Tanhuma on Bereshit, back, back in the beginning of time, second generation of mankind, there were two brothers, Cain and Hevel. And it says that uh, after some time uh, that, uh, that Hevel uh, the Kain brought a an offering from Prihadama and uh, from the ground. Min motor over Amri Zera Pishtan Haya. The rabbis say that what he brought was linen. Linen grows on the ground. The Hevel Hevi Gamhu Ibchorot Sono and the and Hevel would bring from his from his flock. And what's that? That's Nesit Tzemer, Fishtim. That's, that's, uh, that's, uh, so that's Tzemer, that's, that's, uh, that's wool. Wool comes from, comes from the flocks. And so the rabbis say that, uh, that in, in Tanhuma here, in, in the Midrash, says, Shenemar lo tilba shatnes, etc. Vamar Kadosh Baruch Hu, enu din, shit arev minchas hachote, in minchat hazaka, lefichach nesar. So because one of them was good, Hevel was, uh, was good, and Cain killed him. Cain was evil. So not to mix good and evil, that symbolism is the reason for the prohibition from wearing a shotness clothing, a garment made from shotness. So that's, again, that's the Midrash. That's an opinion uh, for why this mitzvah exists. Now, again, I want to emphasize, it is not the only reason. We're going to have two more in just a moment. 
And the reason I gave earlier about the, the, the stifling of the sound is also not the only reason, obviously. And uh, the, just because you have or don't have a reason or you don't like a reason does not mean you don't do the mitzvah. Mitzvah, again, we do because Hashem told us to do it. That's the Rambam. However, you can try to figure out some reasons in order to make it, uh, you know, fit more with your own uh, reasoning. Okay. Comes along the Dazakenim Mibalid Tosvot. These are these are these are the authors of Tosvot in their commentary on the Torah. And again, they say Lo Tilba Shatnes. They uh, they comment on this verse. What do they say? The Fi Sheha Parachat Nase Mishe Mishesh. The curtains in the Mishkan. Were made from sheish. Were made from wool. The sheish kitna umit umit tchelet, and it had in it sewn in tchelet. That tchelet armel hare tzemer ufishtim, and that tchelet was uh, was dyed onto a, uh, a linen object. So the parochet, the curtains, they had. Uh, shotness and they're holy. Uh, they had Shem Rafishtim Biyachtav, Velo Rotsa Kodesh Barahu, Shiyasu Banov to Gumato. And Hashem did not want for his children, in other words, the Jewish people or for humanity to wear the same thing that his Mishkan is wearing. This holy, holy thing, this amazingly intense. Spiritual object, the only physical object that had well, that was a that was a home for the holiness of Hashem's Shechina. This thing, it should be unique, and you're controversing, controverting, sorry, controverting the uniqueness and holiness of this object if you're wearing the same thing, if you're wearing shotness. So the, the, think about this. This is amazing. What we're saying is shotness isn't some evil thing, right? Uh, the Zohar, by the way, does. Uh, we're going to talk, maybe uh, so another year we'll talk about that. But, but uh, the, the, we're not saying shotness is evil, so that's why we don't wear it. Whom fuck it? It's the exact opposite. What we're saying is because shotness is so holy, that is on the that there was shotness in the curtains of the Mishkan. Therefore, you can't wear that too. It's too holy for you. Not too low, too holy. Completely different perspective of what we've seen before. Again, now we have three reasons not to wear shotness. Reason number one: this uh, this answer of it stifles our the sound of our prayers. Answer number two, because it will remind us of good and evil, and those two should be kept separate, because Cain killed Hevel, and that's a shotness, right? And the third reason we have so far is that the parochet, the curtains of the Mishkan, had shotness, and that's too holy for us to wear as well. Now, there's something of a, contra of a contradiction between this answer and the answer of the Chizkuni. Chizkuni famous commentary on the Torah. So, he says, Tzemer Rufishti Miyachtav, Tefi Shabbat, Tekala Al Yidei Shnehem, She'asru Liyot Bevat Achat, Hevel Hevi, Hebechor Otsono Kain. So he also brings the Midrash that we started off with from the Tanchuma about Kain and Hevel. And the very other, so he gives another answer. The fee she shnehem big de kahuna is hiram the vusham the chol rock the mishmartav the shat of odatan a chach no nimsa nega rock the beget semer veget pishtim. He says the kohanim wore wool and linen. The Kohanim are special. 
are you a Kohen too? Are you a Kohen serving in the temple? By the way, as he points out, they wore this, they didn't wear this just regularly. They wore this specifically when they were doing the Avoda. They're doing the service in the Beit Hamikdash. If you're the Kohen doing the service in the Beit Hamikdash, so then you can wear this holy thing. But for you to wear this just when you're going bowling or when you're out and about and you're going to work, that's degrading. That's again, that's degrading, just like uh, just like the Bali Tosfot said about the parochet, you're degrading the value of this great, amazing thing called shotness, which belongs on the Kohen, belongs in the parochet, but does not belong on you. And that's the, that's the answer. That's another reason why shotness is not allowed to be worn. And again, as, as I pointed out, this does uh, definitely stand in, uh, in, in some um, contradistinction to our first answer. Uh, obviously, if they if they if shotness stifles our prayers, then the coins prayers are so much more important. So it could be you could answer. There's a combination of the two things and say that the coin, when he's wearing the shotness, he's supposed to be wearing the shotness. His prayers are not stifled. It's only us when we try to mock the coin, when we try to uh, when we try to parrot something that's holier than what we're where we are standing. That's when that kind of thing can be can become a problem. We are going to skip quite a bit to chapter twenty three, verses four through nine. Yep, quite a few verses because these verses talk about who is and who is not allowed to marry into the Jewish people. And the and Ammonim and Moabites. Just give me a moment. I'm sorry. I need to get uh, some air. I apologize. I hope the uh, sound is not disturbing. And they are not allowed to marry into the Jewish people. Now, they are allowed to convert. They're allowed to believe in Hashem. But uh, but they, they will never be allowed to marry into the Jewish people. Why? So the next verse says, They didn't come out with bread and water when we were leaving Egypt. Asher Sachar Alecha. Uh, at Bilam, they paid Bilam ben Boor, Riftor Aram Araim, Likaleka. They paid Bilam to curse us. Of course, Lo Ava Hashem Elokech Le Shemu El Bilam. Hashem did not listen to the curses of Bilam. Via Hafoch Hashem Elokech Lecha. And the Kavol of Racha, she switched the curses into blessings. Ki Ahev Hashem Elokech, because Hashem loves you. Beautiful verse. Uh, you should not uh, seek their peace or their uh, their good fortune all the days forever. This is these are not nations that you should have any dealings with. And then it says, but don't reject somebody from Edom. Remember Edom. Is uh, the descendants of um, of Esav, uh, but you should not reject him. He's your brother, right? Esav is the brother of Yaakov. And don't also ignore Imitri, an Egyptian. Why? So you were a uh, you were uh, you, you were once a uh, a sojourner in his land. So, if somebody from Mitzrayim or Edom wants to convert to the Jewish people, they can't marry into the Jewish people. They can convert. They can believe in Hashem. They can live in the land and not be idol worshippers. That's great. Their children also cannot marry into the Jewish people, but their grandchildren can. 
And uh, it seems a little strange, and the commentaries are uh, are wondering. We've got uh, seemingly a problem here. The problem being that sometimes we're uh, we're inviting of converts, sometimes we're not, based on what the nation they're from, and it doesn't seem. Sorry, the air is back on. Give me a moment. does not seem consistent why we sometimes are inviting them, why we're not. The Moab and uh, Moab and Amon who came to us and, and tried and didn't sell us food, we're not going to, oh, they can't be Jewish. Amitri, Amitri did some terrible things to us, but, you know, they did some bad things, but that's okay. You know, which, which is worse? So Rashi says, don't reject an Adomi. Legamri completely can't can't reject them completely. Afapi shurui lachal tavo v'yatsa becherev likratecha. Even though uh, he he did the uh, the, uh, the Edomites also threatened us. They also came to the border, and they were, you know, first of all. Even before we get to the border, we've got the, the issue of their uh, great grand grandpappy, our brother Asaf, wasn't always so nice to us either. All right, so lo titeev mitzri, not to ignore mitzri. Mikol Mikol Vakol Afalpi Shizarkus Chorehem Lior. Even though they threw your firstborns into the water, they killed our children. They drowned our babies. We're still going to accept them into the Jewish people. How? Why? Matam, says Rashi. Because because you were there when you needed, they, they let you into their land when you needed them. When you were stuck, when you were in a tough spot, when you were going to die of famine and starvation, the Egyptians let you in. What is this? What is, what is this pointing to? So, seemingly, it seems to be pointing to the idea. Uh, let's look at the Ramban. I think this will clarify things. So, Ramban. Very close by. His commentary is on the uh, is on the fifth verse of the verse. Lo, you could kadmu etchem belechem umayim that they didn't uh, they didn't give you bread and water. So he says. First of all, we find earlier uh, that it seems like they did. Uh, they they, uh, they did provide some of these things for us. Um. Uh, right, uh, remember when Moshe when Moshe was uh, trying to speak to Sichon and uh, try to convince him that we should go through the land and we'll buy the food, etc. There's there's an implication there that we have already done such a thing. So we were the rabbis teach us that we indeed were fed by Moab and Ammon. Uh, we paid for it, etc. But there seems to be something else going on here. And so, says the Ramban, if I can find it quickly enough. Uh, Moavi Khatato Rabotino Darshu Amoni Lo Amoni Moavi Lo Mavi. Okay, so that's something else. One second. Uh, I'm sorry. Um all right, so you, you can look at the source yourself when you get a chance. But he, uh, I'm trying to find it right now. Ah, here, okay. 
Uh, who are Moab and Ammon? Moab and Ammon are the sons of Lot, right? The illegitimate children of Lot and his daughters. And they owe something for their lives to Avraham. Avraham prayed for them to be saved. In other words, he saved them. Otherwise, they would not have been born. Lot would have been killed together with the rest of the people of Sodom, as he probably deserved. And it was only because of Avraham's, uh, you know, uh, in intercessions upon him for, for his sake that Hashem listened and saved Laman. So they owe us something. And still they didn't give us something. So what is the Ramban focusing on? The fact that there is or was supposed to be a Hakarata Tov. There was supposed to be some degree of gratitude. And this evil nation, this evil nation does not have any gratitude at all. We don't want them in the Jewish people. A Jew needs to have gratitude. The main Mida of a Yehuda, of a Yehudi, is from the word Hoda, means gratitude, means being thankful. And if you don't have that, then you're not acting Jewishly. These people who would not be alive if it were not for Avram's prayer did not feel in any way that they owed the Jewish people back and even. Uh, Forget about feeding the Jewish people for free, but they even threaten them. So that shows a, a lack in Hakar Tatov in gratitude, as opposed to, as we look at, we saw in the Rashi, the Hakar Tatov that we have to these evil Mitzrim who killed our babies, but at least they protected us during a time of famine. So, as bad as the Mitzrim are, and as terrible as the, the behavior that the they dis displayed is nevertheless we still have a Tov for the good that they did there was some good and that needs to be thanked and we thank them by inviting them into the Jewish people as opposed to Moab and Ammon who don't have that Mida and we don't want that in the Jewish people that's one of the deeper lessons we can learn from some of these mitzvot as we've been uh, indicating. Uh, the last piece I'd like to share with you today, from an interesting book I have, it's called The Value of a Pasuk. I think it's, uh, it's distributed by Feldheim. Uh, it seems to be an anonymous work. I don't have uh, an author's name. Nevertheless, uh, what the book attempts to do, and does pretty well, is it takes a verse in each parsha, perhaps in a random verse, not really random, and calculates the gematria, the numerical value of that verse. Now, before you tell me, ah, it's gematria, it's a, a fiddle faddle, it's not a big thing, and nobody really cares, you have to understand that the Talmud learns halachot, laws, from the gematria of certain things. For example, in this week's parsha, we have the word get. Or that's not really mentioned, but uh, right, the, the, uh, a man who wants to divorce his wife has to give her a get, a divorce document. From the gematria of Gimel and Tet, which is the spelling of get, Gimel, Tet. Gimel is three, Tet is nine. Three plus nine is 12. From that gematria, the rabbis learned out that a get needs to have 12 lines. If it doesn't have 12 lines, it's not a kosher document. These little things are important. Gematrius. So, in the verse, the next verse, actually after the one we just learned, chapter 23, verse 10, it says, when your, tent, when your camp goes out to war against your enemies, you should be careful, you should guard yourself from any evil thing. That's what it says. 
So in this book, Value of a Pasuk, right, quotes this verse, tells you what the gematria is of each different phrase. Kitei Machane is 624. If you want, I can show you how that's done. Just key is 20 plus 10. That's 30. Uh, Tetzay is 491. Machane is uh, 40 plus 8 plus 50 plus 5. Right? So that comes out to 624. Right? And uh, etc. So uh, each letter has a certain value. The first 10 letters of the of the Aleph Bet, Aleph Bet, Gimel, Dalit, He, Vav, Zion, Chet, Tet, Yud, all have, uh, are all 1 through 10. Then uh, from Yud until Tzadi, you have 1 through 90 in the 10s. And then uh, from uh, Kuf, Reish, Shin, and Taf, you have 100, 200, 300, and 400, respectively. That's a quick summary of Gematria. Now, this, this book points out the Ramban explains that this pasuk serves as an admonition not to speak Lashon Hara, gossip. The Davara, bad thing, refers to Lashon Hara, which will increase machloket, controversy, arguments, and disputes. In other words, what he's saying is, when you go out to war, Ramban is saying, you're about to fight your enemies, that's not a good time for gossip, it's not a good time for controversy and infighting, etc. Uh, he states, If they added to it gossip in order uh, that dispute should not increase among them. Okay, that's uh, so that's what he's saying that the verse is really about. It's about Lashon Hara. Now, we did the gematria, or we showed you the gematria for this entire verse. 624 plus 143 plus 996 plus 90 plus 476 comes out to 2,329. The author of this book, this anonymous author, points out this is one other pasuk in the Torah with a gematria of 2,329. It's in Bereshit 13.1. That pasuk says, and it's about Avram, our forefather, it says, and they went, uh, this is Avram went from Egypt. This is during the time of the famine. Interestingly enough, we just spoke about that. So there's another connection, right? Avram went from Egypt, he and his wife, that's Sarah, Sarai at that point, and all that was his and Lot with him, and they went to the south. A few pesukim later, in Pashat Lech Lecha, the Torah states, There was an argument between the shepherds of Avram and the shepherds of Lot. The Chavetz Chaim explains that the controversy between the shepherds of Ram and the shepherds of Lot serves as an admonition not to speak. Lashon Hara, again. Their controversy illustrates that partnerships can lead to disputes, which in turn gen generate Lashon Hara, gossip. Again, Lashon Hara. He writes that, Try to stay away from shutfot, from being a shutaf, being a partner, because being a partner often leads to Lashon Hara. Avram, im lot lo hitchilu meriva, the Avram and Lot did not originally have any kind of disputes. Elorehem, only their only the shepherds did. Mekevan Sheruim Rabo, and since they had so many shepherds, Huchrach Gam Avram Avinu Lo Mar Lot She Parid Milav. Eventually, Avram had to tell Lot to separate from him. Uh, that's uh, the that's the Chavetz Chaim Al Hatora and Parshat Lech Lecha. Just as the Ramban explains that the going out as a camp could lead to controversy, and the pasuk from Parsha Kitetze is an admonition against speak lashon hara gossip. So too the Chavetz Chaim explains that Avram's partnership with Lot when they went up from Egypt led to controversy, and the pasuk from Lech Lecha is an admonition against speaking lashon hara 
gossip as well. Therefore, it is very befitting that both psukim have the identical gematria. Again, 2329 2329 is the gematria of the verse that tells you when you go out to war to avoid bad things, which the rabbis learn has to do with Lashon Hara, the same gematria is found in this verse regarding Avram and Lot, also having to do, by the way, with what we just spoke about with, uh, with, if, with regard to why Lot and his descendants should have had Hakara Tatov and why they went to, to Sodom to begin with, and the fact that they did not have Hakara Tatov is why those nations, Moab and Ammon, the children of Lot, are not brought into the Jewish people. So another reason being brought here, again, the, the depth of the Torah is what I want to point out here. It's not just these verses. These verses have the same gematria and the same lesson, and you can learn things like that. And if you had a mind great enough to incorporate all of this, you would benefit more from the learning of Torah. And of course, don't just think, ah, I read the Torah, I read the English, so I know all there is to know. There's so much depth and so much beauty in learning Torah that I strongly recommend if you've, if you've already... Uh, if you're looking for new commentaries, a, a quick little book like this just uh, takes a couple of minutes a day, a couple of minutes a week. Whatever it takes will, Im- will increase your, uh, your appreciation for the Torah, for the great holy Torah that Hashem has given us. And that in, its, in and of itself would be a great scoot for you. And of course, Torah, is a, this is a great time of the year to start, you know, Elul, the time of the year to start thinking about Teshuvah. And part of Teshuvah, for sure, for sure, there's no such thing as teshuva without Torah. You need to learn Torah, see, uh, to to learn and to grow closer to Hashem. We should all merit to do such. And again, this uh, this class should be a, a schut for us and a schut for Helen Dover, Leah Bat Moshe. Thank you for listening and have a Shabbat Shalom.